Uh, good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, I'd like to invite you to the discussion, uh, which is uh, hosted by Villa Desis, the Institute for Culture, um, which is the host of the residency program of the International City of Refuge Network, uh, as well as by the Multicultural Center, which is hosting our open new spaces from there. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed today's meeting and I really, really encourage you. Uh, to involve, uh, to get involved in the discussion and to ask questions uh, basically anytime you want, uh, especially when we will be heading towards the end and uh, you have any thoughts on the matter. Thank you. Have fun. My name is Ayun Min. I'm a writer and mixed media artist. My work is centered on issues pertaining to race, racism, migration, gender, sex, and sexuality, as well as the post-coloniality. As a writer, my work draws upon experiences of growing up in Southern Africa and the creation of wasteland and religious dogma by colonialism. Like this? <laughs> Since 2016, I've worked with various artists and institutions in Scandinavian contexts, focusing primarily on state-sanctioned violence towards racial minorities, discriminatory border regimes, and police brutality. Currently, I live in Krakow as part of the ICOR residency program. In February 2022, I published the poetry collection called Broken Hearts of the North Descent, which I will read a poem from. Um, which is one, and this same collection is now in its final stages uh, for publication here in Poland. And now I will be introducing our speakers. Firstly, we have Magdalena Gilefek, who studied Polish philology and journalism at the Jagiellonian University. For almost 10 years, she's been the editor of the largest and oldest website of LGBT people in Poland. Queer Since 2012, she's been involved in the organization of the Queer Main Festival and the Krakow Equality March. In 2013, a board member of the Romanosh.org.pl <laughs> Foundation, which deals with strengthening the LGBT community and anti discrimination activities in smaller cities in southern Poland. A member of the Equal Treatment Council appointed in May 2019 by the President of Krakow, Jacek Majewski. Since, since 2020, she has been cooperating with, with the Deputy Office of Matije Duma in Krakow. Welcome, everyone. Secondly, we have Karol. Kuczynski, a journalist, teacher, and lecturer at the Yale University. He studies the issues of forced migrations and Islamophobia, and also promotes global education and solutions for the integration of foreigners. He co-creates the Salam Lab platform, educating on migration and human rights in Polish, and supporting people in need. He has written reportages from Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, and recently on the borderlands of Belarus, Lithuania, and Poland. Okay. And lastly, we have Stegi Chuplina, a translator, educator, and activist from Kiev, who has been living in Krakow for eight years, graduated from the Jagiellonian University, a member of the Jewish Community Center, volunteering at the Mass Events Foundation. Thank you for being here. So I will just go ahead um, and ask the questions to get the show running. So the first question is, how is it that queer people of foreign origin can be integrated in Polish society with Islamophobia being a stand in physicals? So of course, like, Question is framed in a way that you can understand it. Understand it that I don't know, like uh, migrants should do something to get integrated. I don't know, 
doesn't work. Like, I mean, magnets should work, but it's also um, like a duty and the work needs to be done from the so-called host society. So we have you know, people in Krakow or in Poland, and we have people uh, who uh, live here. And, uh, this is the role of both of these groups to, to do something, to work together and to integration. And of course, uh, Islamophobia, homophobia, all these stereotypes about different groups, racism, of course, um, uh, are signs of something deeper. I mean, they, they are the signs that uh, there is so much to be done in uh, education and uh, in uh, yeah, shaping our minds uh, in Poland. Uh, and it is not being done. And it is a big obstacle in integration, not only with like, you know, Ukrainian, Jewish, Roma, uh, black people coming from wherever. I mean, it's a problem within the society. I mean, for, it is a problem uh, of, of this, this uh, so-called host society. So uh, uh, these are signs that we are not integrated within our own society. And I always tell. Uh, you know, there are there are many examples like Ukrainians coming to Poland that they many times complain about the level of health system and healthcare in Poland, and uh, they complain about how how it's possible that I need to wait like five years for operation or six months for my uh, cancer treatment or whatever. And I say, yeah, we live like this in Poland, you know, and it's normal. I mean, it's not like we are discriminating you or insult like I myself. The same, and uh, you know, it's like with the racism. I mean, the system is is wrong. It's bad. It's spoiled. It's corrupted, uh, and it affects everyone. And uh, uh, really, it affects like if you read uh, like classic works about racism, like Franz Fanon, he will always claim that it's affecting not only the, the victims but also those who are actually racist. And uh, I think that there's also an aspect specifically talking about the situation of bringing refugees coming to Poland because definitely a certain percentage of them are uh, Muslims. Uh, but we have this sort of a privilege, which is a Polish passing privilege. So. Um, from the first sight, you cannot really understand whether the person is Ukrainian or Polish, what religion do they belong to, unless they wear a hijab or um, in any other way to um, visually express uh, their uh, religious identity. But specifically in a context of Islamophobia, it's not really something that I have heard about a lot in context of Ukrainians, but rather we're such a combo to say so we're already Ukrainian, we're already refugees um plus if adding to this any other kinds of hate uh, it's not really specifically seen towards ukrainians so in the aspect of islamophobia i would rather say that i have not observed it specifically which doesn't mean it doesn't exist um on the other hand if talking institutionally um there is a beautiful saying in Ukraine, you never get hit into the face, you get hit into your passport. So as soon as we take out a passport, this Polish passing privilege disappears. So for the institution, you're exactly the same foreigner as everyone else. And indeed, there might be some um, prejudice still, which is reminiscent of old times. I'm not saying absolutely that every single uh, every single governmental worker does so. It's a very minor percentage, I would say, but it still happens, let's face it. Um, but yeah, I would still say that we're all equal in this in terms of we're not being hit into the face, but we're being hit into our passport from the point of institutions. Uh, and for me, of course, is uh, a local LGBTQI activist. It's, uh, I wanted to be lost because it's for me, what is important is that I listen to you and I hear you what I'm saying as a political, like, uh, not the context. And for us, of course, it's for our organizations or initiatives, uh, it's about, like, uh, 
hearing, listening to, and uh, trying to answer, answer the needs and uh, being able to create like, uh, safe spaces and, and welcoming uh, community, uh, especially on the local level, for, um, for people who because of course in Poland it's a it's a question I, I get a lot recently uh, since uh, since the twenty fourth of February. Uh, what about LGBTQI refugees from Ukraine uh, when it comes to the situation, the political and social situation in Poland now and the attitudes towards our community? So and it's after like two months I, I still don't know how, how to answer. And of course it's a challenge we have, uh, but. We, what we are doing is because we want like our community uh, to feel safe, to have the same rights. Uh, but on the other hand, now I also as, as, uh, as someone who like uh, I was in touch with a few people who are coming to Krakow who are queer, and uh, I'm scared about their safety, for example, uh, because if the one thing when it comes to Islamophobia, for example, like Carol said, is that of course we have like a Biases, prejudices, stereotypes, uh, and when it comes to the like queer identity, it's something uh, something more uh, difficult. Uh, and for me, it's also like things connecting with, of course, also like uh, doing some systemic changes. Uh, and what we need is also like looking for allies, like you know, in the local governments, uh, especially in the situation now when on the central level it's uh, almost impossible. Uh, so for me, it's, it's still like a lot of work to do, uh, but we are still learning. And after those, especially after the three very difficult years for our community and for organizations and initiatives, it's still like uh, more and more challenges we face. Thank you. And the second question is: um, How are spaces? Created for queer people and anybody else that is perceived as the other um, in Polish society, and how do they stay focused on prioritizing those people and their specific issues? Because I I understand that in the context you have a group of people who um, migrate into that context, and there will be pressures on you to assimilate or being rejected from that space. But if we're speaking from the vantage point of, say, queer um, migrants within an LGBT organization in Poland, um, how is it that the needs of those people continuously stay prioritized as much as possible? Not to say that they should be prioritized at the expense of anybody else, anybody else but just... Um, um, for example, when it comes to, um, to Ukrainian poor people, we have to remember that also that uh, already a lot of people since 2014, and for example, there were also like, uh, you know, when it comes to Crimean Association, we had like the volunteers. Um, uh, and for us, it, again, it was uh, like diagnosing, diagnosing and speaking with people and asking them if they need something and how can we support them. Uh, in doing it, and for example, like in you know integrating or creating like uh, space for you know having like your own community and to feel, to feel safe um, uh, in this community. Uh, so I think that it's something what might happen now. We are thinking of the initiative to learn more, more about this, but that there are already like queer communities uh, in, in Krakow, for example, which are welcoming like you know LGBTQI refugees that are welcoming here. But for example, what I see in the last, uh, last uh, weeks, uh, I hear a lot of more and more stories about, for example, like queer people who are coming to Krakow, and for example, they are in private quarters, and they don't know how to reach community. They, uh, they don't want to go out, for example, to meet new people. And also, it's something for us how to, and for us, like, together to work, uh, how to reach these people uh, so they can. Uh, so they know how to reach for support um, and so on. Mm, what else? Uh, and yeah, it's uh, for me, for example, as someone who is like you know, I'm like obsessed about community building and community organizing. So it's something I'm still learning now. Uh, and
and and again, uh, it's uh, it's also like we have to think, for example, if we are opening up in, in Krakow with the support of the city. So there's like a clear message, for example, from the city that we are welcome here also, not only that we are migrant, but also because because we are a queer person and who is here and uh, and it's a part of society. society. I don't know how to answer about prioritizing <laughs> because it's more um, it's more about like asking about those needs and answering answering those those needs very much. I think it's pretty simple. I do actually think that in the context of current foreign trade, uh, Polish LGBT organizations did quite a lot, I would even say way more than it was expected from them, from the point of the refugees, because um, Ukraine in and of itself isn't that much of a country with a developed LGBT community. We do have larger cities here, right, out of the France of Asia, right? But other than that, um, there isn't much of a community building to say, except for, I don't know, meeting on social media and uh, maybe going to clubs or queer events. Um, but in fact, if a person is not involved in the creation of, uh, of various queer spaces and queer events, rather they're not also that much associated with the community. Therefore, it might be slightly weird for queer people coming from Ukraine to come to Poland and to see that there are a lot of institutionalized uh, possibilities to get support. Um, rather, you're just like, well, I'm good enough with just being Ukrainian, that's fine, I'm getting enough for what I want to have. And that queer aspect oftentimes goes to kind of like a secondary issue to them and only after they have stabilized here they're starting to look for a community that is going to be um, more specific to them in this context because in fact when you're fleeing for your life you don't really care if the person who sleeps next to you is straight or gay you just want to not have function above you and to have somewhere to sleep and something to eat um but also Kinda ish. I was pretty surprised by the reaction of a lot of organizations, not only locally in Krakow. Um, one of the first things that I've that I noticed specifically aimed at the queer refugees from Ukraine was the uh, Stonewall Hostel. Uh, Stonewall is the uh, Stonewall is the organization from Poznan, if I remember correctly. Um, at the train station, and I was like, "Well, wow, that's nice." And Going deeper and deeper into this, I just one of my friends asked me, hey, I'm writing an article on topic of how queer refugees are dealing and what is the institutional support for queer refugees. And I literally started digging into this, finding a huge amount of organizations that are actually trying to support in one or the other way. Um, but yeah, if I would not go to, to seek to look for that, I would rather not know about the existence of such support. Same probably for the queer refugees. Plus, well, let's face it, um, in terms of current situation with the war in Ukraine, um, we're getting just a specific category of refugees. So let's not forget that um, in Ukraine, it's still an active uh, army uh, prescription. So, conscription, sorry. So, uh, pretty much everyone who is a male in between 18 and 60 cannot leave legally, um, which limits more or less that just exclusively to women or people who identify as women, which also is not always the case because even though we do have laws that are enabling transitioning and stuff, but unfortunately, a lot of people who identify as trans or who are in the process of a transition, even people post transition, uh, who didn't change their documents, for example, they still cannot leave, even if they do identify as female or transitioning into um, into female. So, uh, yeah, that's, in my opinion, rather um, a perspective of reaching specific audiences, figuring out their specific needs, and um, trying to get to help them, not exactly in the moment of, um, of 
arrival, but rather in the moment of them accommodating around and understanding what's going on and more or less stabilizing here. Okay, so, um, what, what I see, and I'm constantly trying to repeat this to the, the LGBTQI institution, uh, organizations and initiatives in Poland now, uh, that because of what, what's happening in the last three years, we're like completely, like perfectly organized. And uh, since the first day of war, I saw this and I was so surprised that it was because we are networked. We, we have our own, like, uh, you know, groups uh, of support and we know how to do this, like, also, like, on a grassroots level. So, uh, what I'm saying, also, like, in, in, um, in Warsaw, Lata Warsaw, uh, they have, like, a great office. I was there in the last two days on workshops. And uh, they already like support support supports like three hundred people I think, and they are just like you know completely perfectly organized. It's like the Polish lessons, like uh, psychological support, like an intervention um, uh, apartment for people. So like they have like you know packs with the food and crosses and everything, and it just uh, when when we had when we had like those workshops and like you know people just were coming there to just sit and you know. To feel another people, so it was really, really touching. Uh, so it's also like, from one hand, we completely tired and burned out after the last three years, but from the other hand, when when there is a need, we, we are able to like organize in like one or two days. So I think I cannot just add. Uh, since the beginning of war, I experienced that we had support from our partner organizations in, uh, uh, in our shelter in Ostra, There were these big posters that if you need like help from from the holiday center, and there was like great help there. So there were signs, but uh, my organization, Salma, is not focusing on on uh, LGBT plus. Rights, I mean, we are just focusing on human rights, and uh, it's like a part of it. Uh, and it's important part for, for us because of the situation in Poland. And, uh, and uh, uh, what we do right now is uh, like we are trying to focus because the safe spaces are super important. I mean, they are necessary, they are super important. I mean, it's like Sergei said. You first you take care of your life, but maybe in the next step you will need this kind of space and you need the proper information where to find that. Because you want to, uh, I don't know, you don't want to uh, stay uh, and hide your identity. But um, what we try to do right now is to prepare a space which will be open for everyone. So Ukrainian house is super important. J Jewish Community Center is super important, LGBT plus center is super important. But what is also very important is a space which is not like a box, which only you know it's open for this certain people. Because if you I don't know, if you go to a space which is called the Food Cafe, you go to Ukrainian house and uh, it gets clear that you are interested in the design of the and all this Ukrainian stuff. And uh, this is not necessarily what I want to do, or other foreigners want to do, or other refugees want to do, or other people just want to do. Uh, but this Ukrainian house is very important for Ukrainian refugees to feel safe. So, what is also important is to focus on creating spaces which are not necessarily labeled as LGBT or as refugee or as Jewish or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is also a question on how to build that. And uh, this is something, this is a challenge we are already facing. Mm -hmm. So it will be safe for Muslim people and for LGBT plus that we can have a rainbow and uh, have you know, some religious materials and nobody is offended that we know that we are saving lives here mm -hmm. first. But then, um, and it's a challenge, especially it's a challenge when it comes to Roma people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is this minority from, from Ukraine which, which faces all the discrimination both in Poland and in Ukraine. So I feel that this is a community we should focus right now in terms of they are like much more discriminated against than anything and I'm shocked actually how much they are discriminated against.
I actually just um, um, read an article a couple of days ago that talks about how um, this group of Roma people were um, interviewed after crossing um, the border. And how here in, <clears throat> in Poland there was this image of um, Ukrainians are welcome, but it didn't apply to them to the point where they are denied housing, even. And these are people who are destitute. And so um, this brings me to the third question about um, how is the intersection between queerness, nationality, um, race, or ethnicity, and migration operationalized in the Polish context because you know there is um, there is a Ukrainian house for Ukrainians to go and feel welcome in, but Ukraine also has ethnic minorities within that. And when they arrive, are they considered just as Ukrainian as the ones that the house is built for? Um, or when it comes to um, to just other migrants as well, right? I mean, Poland has really open. Um, it's arms to like Ukrainians, um, but nothing seems to really. This generosity is not extended to Belarusians, for example, and it's certainly not extended to um, black and brown people who migrate here. So, um, I'm not saying that this should be within the capacity of you three to be able to uh, solve, but what. Um, in your opinion, can be done about this. Um, so, generally speaking, comparing Poland versus Ukraine, so I had an opportunity to live in both the countries. Uh, I would rather say a little bit less in Poland, but still. Um, just comparing to countries as a whole, even though it's generalizing, even though it's idealizing. Um, Poland is way more homogenous than Ukraine is. So Poland, in fact, is 98% white Polish Catholic, with a spice of a Kashubian, so it's Asian, and not a lot of uh, Muslim minority, uh, which is still major and exists, etc. So those are just small indications of, of something which is different from white Polish Catholic. Uh, while Ukraine, if comparing to that, is not as homogenous. So even though a lot of people do carry Ukrainian passport, as I rightfully mentioned, that there are a lot of national minorities in within Ukraine. Uh, plus, as a reminiscence of Soviet Union, a lot of, uh, let's say, friendly uh, states were able to send their students to, uh, to Ukraine to study. So a lot of them actually stayed. So we do have a sensible uh, brown black community, uh, which is natively Ukrainian, and uh, they feel both black and Ukrainian. And some of them might be also the part of the alphabet mafia, which uh, all of those identities coexist in them with no troubles. Uh, but in fact, that this difference in how society perceives the difference might be one of the largest issues here, which no way to the society we are here, we are the ones talking about it and trying to fix it, but still we are, let's say, a minority in this factor, in this factor uh, which hopefully that will change. I can add to that uh, the experience of my colleague, she's from Papua Papua Papua. She was born in Mielinski. Uh, and she always says that she must prove that she's really a Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So when we talked about building the Ukrainian center in central uh, Krakow, she said, okay, I will come there, but we will see. They will ask me for a passport to prove that I'm a real Ukrainian. You know? And the same goes with Roma people. And the same goes sometimes even with say Asian Tatars and the Polish minorities who don't fit this Roman Catholic Polish conservatist uh, picture. Um, so what we can do, I believe that we should learn, especially as uh, I don't know people who work on these issues, 
to create safe spaces and to create safe spaces in this sense that uh, maybe not safe, but the open spaces, right? To be sure that everyone feels welcome, right? That it's not only like a Ukrainian flag or Jewish flag or whatever flag, but that we create an open space also um, for, for those who don't fit this model. Okay. Last week, when uh, um, I was going home by tram, and I saw like there are two um, like same sex couple, a uh, black couple, uh, it, 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 the males who were like kissing and hugging in a tram in Krakow. And my first thought was that I don't want that something bad is gonna happen to, to them. So it's, but the one thing is that. We are still in a bubble in Krakow. Um, it's like an open, diverse, uh, multicultural city. But on the other hand, uh, it's still like, you know, I have like at the back of my head that uh, something bad can happen all the time. And uh, many times, uh, foreign journalists asked me, uh, since 2019 and in 2020, if I'm like afraid of walking on the streets in Krakow. Like wearing like you know rainbow bag or like rainbow pins and so on, and for me it was like I don't because I do it all the time. Uh, but it happened to me also that someone was like trying to me uh, on the street in those like two years. But I feel safe here, and I know that it's my privilege. Uh, and of course, what I'm trying to do is like using this privilege uh, to to support people. Uh, who, for example, are looking for like, support in our initiatives and organizations. I also think that, and I will still say this, <laughs> that it's uh, it's also like uh, we need this support, this institutional support in education, the social identity, and I think it's really important. I, I say this also because I see that in the last two years, like uh, we are constantly on a, in a, in a level of Symbolic support, and I think that it's like the moment that we have to move on, that something will change, and of course, it has to move on on a local level, also. Uh, so, what else? It's, uh, there's so many difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, I must, I must confess that I, I was like uh, coming here and more like, you know, being uh, now that probably I will learn from you, so thank you for this. Uh, but for us, uh, it, it's of course about uh, like uh, hearing, being, and you know, just welcoming communities uh, which are in need, for example. Uh, another thing is that uh, when there were signs uh, when the war started that uh, the people of black and brown people with problems on the borders, and it was also that, that, that a lot of LGBT uh, activists and organizations, or you know, like also from the like in the Western countries, were really involved in uh, trying to figure out what is happening, how to support, and I know also like the LGBT people in Krakow who are like welcoming those people in their homes. So I think it's also like a matter of like be, knowing that we we uh, know how it is to be like you know excluded from 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 the society, for example. So and also all those tools when it comes to discrimination. So it's like obvious. <coughs> That uh, people were trying to to support and help if they could. I would actually love to add to to what Martha just said because um, having the back, the background of being Jewish, um, it's a uh, one of the best things that I've learned from the Jewish community in here. That um, maybe it's in our ideological line, maybe it's uh, our generational trauma, but. As soon as you are being discriminated against, you are not willing to allow that to happen to anyone else. So that's why I think that, that was one of the reasons, moral reasons, why a lot of LGBT organizations, why a lot of national minority organizations, organizations that help refugees, uh, rushed to support all the different varieties of people because understandably they might have been discriminated against in that or the other way 
And absolutely, as soon as we don't get to the level where um, discrimination is socially stigmatized, whatever type of the discrimination that is, uh, we're probably not going to get rid of the problem with the discrimination by any kind of factor, whether that is race, sexual preference, sexual orientation, color of eyes, color of hair, etc., etc. There are certain things that we do not discriminate against, like the color of hair and color of eyes. Uh, but for some reason, we do discriminate against other things, like sexual orientation or color of the skin or the language that the person speaks. Um, in my opinion, that all stems from the educational gap or simply lack of education about it. But that's also kind of pretty idealistic for the current time and politics to quickly educate the whole nation on, hey, well, that's bad because this is bad, and that's bad because this is bad. But as soon as we're speaking about it, as soon as we're doing something, I think that's a huge success already. We might think, oh, yeah, it's a small team of people who share the same interest. But in the same way of helping currently the refugees, it's just one small drop in the sea, but a lot of drops make up the sea together. So let's just do what we can the best and educate the people around us. So. so I hit agree that uh, just just uh, I would love the situation that everyone who is a victim of discrimination doesn't discriminate, but I would say it's not the case. It's not Unfortunately, I mean, I, I, that is why I respect that much the CC community, which does so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, but I mean, uh, unfortunately, this is not the case. But I would still be here as a white male, straight, uh, with Christian background, of you know, totally representative of a privileged majority in this country. And uh, you know, I always ask this question: What I should do? What I should do? Because I, I, I didn't experience. I experienced discrimination as a Polish person in UK, but it was like fifteen years ago, and it didn't change me a lot. I mean, um, but uh, I still remember that, of course. But uh, I had this uh, workshops recently, and uh, maybe you can do this exercise that. Uh, we were asked to list 10 people who are our most trustworthy uh, collaborators in what? Not like partners, not like family, but the people we work with. So imagine these 10 people. And the next step, uh, if you list these people, it's not easy to list 10 people you trust actually. But then ask yourself how, how diverse is this group? So how many of these people are different age? Um, if they are straight or gay, if they are black or white, if they are whatever, like there are certain, how many women are there, how many men are there, and you know, it's like a good exercise to imagine how many people you really listen to in terms of, you know, listening to diverse voices, because if you trust someone, it means that you also listen to this person. And it was really like a good exercise for me because it showed me that usually I have like ninety person, like nine women and just one man on the list. And uh, but I also saw that this is like quite not a diverse group. But I need to do something uh, to reach out and uh, try to build a trustful relationship with those colleagues or with these people I work with who are not necessarily within this group, but for example, like more old women or like uh, more people who are having this experience of being black or living in this country. And I also just want to add that um, intersectionality is such an important thing in the sense that as you um, go higher and higher in your intersections as an individual, um, the more like the more um, points of discrimination you have. And I think that saying that um, people who experience discrimination don't uh, discriminate, it creates this um, false narrative that at the end of the day that there is somebody that's just like inherently good, or that if you 
uh, are the victim of something that is not perpetrated. And as you know, with psychology, that's not the case. If you have not dealt with the trauma or it's systemically under the same predicament, um, you will perpetrate what is being done onto you. That's what's more likely to happen than not. Um, you could even argue that one of the reasons why uh, Ukrainians were so openly welcoming the EU was because of the saviorist complex, because now there was a common enemy, which is Russia. So this might not actually have anything to do with, discreet, with uh, genuine generosity per se, but more that there is an agenda. Um, and then also, I think that often in leftist sphere, there is this tendency to have conversations like the ones the one we're having, which I think are very really good, but then they are born and die in this case. They aren't often transported. So when we talk about education, how can this have a triple down effect in in the society that we're in? Because I do think that uh, humans have the, uh, the, the capacity to commit atrocious things, but we can also do great things. And often context is what informs who and how we are. So if people are incredibly ignorant, and that's why they have um, right-wing conservative values, how is it that this information can access them then? Just to clarify, because I've heard from both of you that are doing it again. Um, the thing that I mentioned about the, the generation of and stuff, it is rather the generalization of certain groups of people who are absolutely, I do agree, whereas there are a holes in every single kind of group of people with no exclusion, we're all different. But at the same time, I do agree with what you said about the access to the information. The, the most, um, the, the, the highest, I would say, um, issue in this in this context about whether left, right, whatever way, is exactly the access to the information. That's why a lot of people who are called oligarchs, they actually go on the information channels to be able to send their narrative, whatever that narrative is, to the masses. So Um, I'd like to invite the audience um, to ask us questions if they have any. Please do not be shy. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm Rita from North Dakota, the center in Kabul. I would like to ask you, now that you just said you would do to help about 300 people, you don't know, war in one hour or so. Okay. Do you know how many people did you help? When it comes to my person and my uh, my initiatives, it was maybe around thirty here, but also no, because with uh, with the Burma Association, uh, Quality of Your Foundation, and the Center Burma, at the beginning of March, we decided to mix our strength and powers. Let's say uh, this like this. Um, so I'm not sure how many people. Uh, just they helped, but I think that maybe very similar. But I will ask them. It's, it's very hard to find any data. I know why. Uh, I know uh, also the reasons, but just to prove to another another organization or to other um, something data to to work on it and to talk with another um, foundation association to press something. We need to have data to to go to. to Address something, and I uh, was just wondering how many people from this group would you know um, uh, would like to stay in Poland, or how many would like to leave? Uh, it's a very uh, good question. I spoke about it with Lambda mm -hmm. and uh, for company or so, and I heard that uh, ninety percent of people want to come back. And I also know here like a queer people who already went to Ukraine. So uh, it's I think that and what was also interesting for me that uh, 
uh, we were uh, we were supporting the people who are in transit, for example, to Czechia or to Germany. Uh, but I know also like cases. I I heard cases that people don't want to go to the Western country. They like queer people. So for us, it was at the beginning of war. It was like you know uh, maybe you know we we are like network with the German or LGBTQI organization and so on, and maybe it was like a safer safer place for it, but people didn't want to come there. So. Uh, it was also interesting uh, for the reasons I heard that it's like closer to Ukraine uh, and it's also like a matter of culture uh, and also like I think when it comes to the bigger the bigger cities like Warsaw for example and Poznan they were already also like networked with the um, uh, LGBTQI organizations in Ukraine so Yes. Um, do you think that, that um, the info of so many uh, people from Ukraine that have children and their children basically go to school, it's like to study different cultures, and do you think it will help children uh, both in Poland and uh, in Germany and in refugees to, um, you know, to see that world is diverse and to be a more accepting towards um, minorities. Do you, do you ask about what should be done that uh, these children feel more accepted in schools? Uh, well, I think it's more like uh, school. I mean, uh, do you think that this uh, experience of uh, people, uh, many people from different, uh, from another country and another culture, can uh, positively influence uh, both like Ukrainian children and uh, Polish children? Like see because they see the differences like uh, in cultures, and it can help, for example, the younger generations uh, to be more uh, welcoming towards diversity. That was my question. It depends. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, if uh, Ukrainian children will be forced to be uh, treated like uh, Minister Charnak does, so. To call him, not everyone should pass the natural, natural examination. Uh, I mean, not everyone should be a minister, right? And uh, come on, um, the, the, the children, Ukrainian children, will, I don't know, teach about, uh, learn about uh, Shekhevich, Volny uh, genocide, or like uh, all the wars we had with Ukrainians since 17th century, like they do about Islam or like they do about colonialism and about the, you know, pride, white civilization, conquering all the earth. I mean, if you if you give this kind of lessons to Ukrainian and Polish children, I mean, what will be naturally born in these contacts, in like in a positive way, will be killed by uh, what they are actually discussing in schools. And unfortunately, this right wing agenda we have in schools can actually kill this natural tendency to have a dialogue, right, in the, in the playground. Um, so I'm rather pessimist about Ukrainian children in Polish schools. And I must uh, point the fact when it comes to the education of uh, Ukrainian children, the Polish Ministry of Education had this law that all children from Ukraine are exempted from duty. To school, which probably means that children from minorities or excluded uh, families, poor families, will not go to school at all. Um, I kind of agree with Carol because, um, let's say, like this, children themselves are like a sponge. They ingest whatever is being given to them and they do it quickly, they absorb everything. So from one perspective, from one point of mind, yeah, that might be beneficial in the fact that children do see the differences and the commonalities between their cultures, but at the same time, let's look at the US, for example. The narratives that are being taught in school are still influencing, even though children are going to 
the mixed race uh, classes, it doesn't mean that systemic racism that is being taught and overimposed on them is not getting absorbed by some of those challenges. So, as Karo said, it depends on what will be taught to those children and how generally those children will be sent to perceive one another. I, I'm like in, in the middle, to be honest, between you, but uh, it's the same when it comes, for example, for uh, when it comes to rainbow families. Uh, that very often it's not a problem for kids that someone is like two moms and two dads uh, until someone will tell them that it's a problem. Uh, and I already like know cases like this that, for example, like a couple was preparing for a long time to have this uh, you know presentation in the school, and finally it happened not to be like an issue for, for the kids. Uh, but uh, of course, what I said about education, um, that like how can we do something with people like Barbara Nova in Western Poland, for example, uh, with people like this in the public sphere. So it's, uh, it's, it's, we can like do a lot of grassroots work and uh, of course like burn out completely on trying to do an informal education so already like a lot of organizations is doing, but uh, but we have to like have a change you know, of people like this in uh, who are like have an influence on, on Polish education, and uh, also for me it's uh, what I'm thinking now is uh, for me like the priorities of for example when it comes to LGBT agenda changed like in three years also because. Uh, uh, we spoke a lot about the marriage equality, for example, but now I feel like the education and, for example, like the mobilization um, uh, of the penal code when it comes to the hate crimes <laughs> is, is something which we have to speak a lot of. Uh, and it's also like not about uh, only like the queer people, but, 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 but like it's, it's important for everyone. Now. Well, and also, especially when we were thinking about like there are also like Ukrainian people not here and the queer Ukrainian people. I also just want to add that um, right now it's uh, the question was around the culture uh, between Polish and Ukrainian children would make them uh, would be beneficial to them. I also I think that it's firstly how Polish society uh, perceives Ukrainian culture. Uh, first and foremost, and secondly, how these two groups of children are different from each other. One group is war refugees, and they will they will behave like children who are war refugees, and that can create a kind of um, a dynamic that exists in dysfunction that will be very easy to just put up as Ukrainian behavior. For example, um, there could be so many other issues because again. The psychology of these children has been tampered with so heavily that it's not just culture that will be the thing that will other them. Um, also, because I'm assuming that the Ukrainian children that you're speaking about are white Ukrainians. So, um, unless the, the, if, if the passport thing is presented, then that would be the thing that will demarcate these kids as being an other. In that way, but I think what would it have meant if the children in question were Roma going to school with Polish children? Because there is already a pre existing culture of discriminating against Roma people, and that exists because that kind of practice is just passed on and on and on, and it hasn't been broken yet. So I think that um, it depends, ideally, if um, it should be beneficial to everybody to be surrounded by culture and absorb it in the, in the ways that it uh, benefits people, but I think that people have no children, they have their own hands. I said, uh, but people uh, are we're too disorganized, mm -hmm. and that often leads to violence. Yeah, I just wanted to amplify that intersectionality is super important and um, wonder if something like um, 
ask you guys to talk about the question that you posed, like these conversations are born and they mm-hmm. die in these spaces. My understanding is that there's a march or a festival, a queer festival on the 21st in three days in Krakow, if I'm not mistaken. So that's like a very public thing, right? That's great. But what about in all of your guys' experiences, how do we not have I'm not diverse, uh, but especially after the women's strikes, which happened in Poland in 2020, for me it was like uh, I, I became obsessed by you know like doing all those small things around us because in, in so like unfriendly political situation for me it's something uh, which is uh, empowering me and strengthening, uh, and I also see that it's uh, it's also like strengthening like the people. In, in those our small communities, um, so it's something I'm trying to do. And of course, what, for example, when it comes to um, activism uh, with our uh, initiatives, we're also trying to do things we want to do. It's uh, and I'm a co-organizer of the Krakow Pride on Saturday, and it's something I've been doing for the 11, 11 years now. And more and more, I feel that I don't want to do it <laughs> because I'm like tired and you know, uh, so it's something. Uh, so I'm trying just like you know, taking from activism what, uh, what is like important for me, uh, and of course like you know, learn from people. So if I'm doing something in the wrong way, I just want to do it, and uh, also like you know, experience um, like from the people what is what is important for them. I don't know if I answered the question, but like, I'm sorry for the chaos, but, but it's a very important question. And I, uh, because now after the pandemic, there is like a lot of movements like this, and uh, it's something I also like see that, that the problem is that we are, like, I feel that for the, when it comes to LGBTQI community and uh, everything that's happening around this topic in Poland, uh, we're still speaking about the same. <laughs> so. Uh, so I, what I what, for me it was like matter of yeah of course we know that we have to do this 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 but if we want like if we would just be like you know completely upset about like doing these this big things like visible uh, and so on and of course like pride is important for people and we know this that's why we're also like doing it uh, because we hear this and people want to like have this moment like those two hours per year uh, in which they can feel like themselves here on the, the streets of their own city. Um, but for me it's like, you know, focusing on the small things, small communities, small rallies also. Because you know, when we when we had like those uh, rallies for many thousands of people, uh, yeah, it looked good in India, for example. But for me it was that when I when we are doing a rally for an important topic for us and there is like I don't know 200 people we can like connect with those people we can sometimes the people stay and want to engage for example and ask them how can I support you or how can I feel engaged and you know just make a change with you I think um, my answer to your question is of course that the ones who are um, uh, Lower and the and the class change should be the ones that get um, the most assistance since they're the ones that need it because sure um, there are refugees but and this sounds pro- this might sound problematic but it's not but not all refugees are equal right because there are um, Ukrainians who came here but had you know, like an, the group very affluent people, you know, and you can and in comparison, you see you know, poorer people having to wait for longer and getting here at a later stage. I myself am a refugee, but I'm not in a situation that um, Ukrainians find themselves in or um, um, other black refugees in um, Southern Europe or Northern Europe for that matter. I'm here, I'm doing an art residency. So even though I'm a refugee, I can't claim that I'm having the same experiences as those people. So I don't think that the help uh, that goes towards refugees needs to be um, needs to be as rudimentary for me as it needs to be for them. 
Um, so I think that in as much as um, transplanting these conversations go, I would say that because I have the means and the resources to have this conversation and to create events or um, write things or just you know knowledge production that through some means will be you know um, reaching a wider audience, then that's what I will do. Um, if I need, um, if I hear people like the refugees who were, um, or not the refugees, but the black people who were stuck in the Ukrainian border, um, I found out about it like right before it all got blown up in the media because I have family who lived in Ukraine and they were the ones sending WhatsApp videos and voice notes talking about the things that were going on. So for me, as a refugee myself, but I had the resources to do something about it. So I would send them money if I could, you know? And I think that that's what needs to happen because I think that everybody need, everybody wants a revolution, but no one wants to do the dishes. Everyone wants to be labeled as a hero. But I think that at the end of the day, a lot of the work that is truly impactful is quiet and it happens behind the scenes and it's tedious and it's gross, but you have to do it because that's what's going to, you know, push things along. Because I think that if you if you act in this sort of very explosive way, it burns quickly. And at the end of the day, it doesn't change very much, like you mentioned. The protests here look very good on TV. And I think it's still amazing that all of these people took to the streets to protest. But what was the effect of it at the end of the day? Like two years on from now, you know, where are people standing? So I think that when it comes to class, it also, it's about sharing the a privilege. And I'm not saying privilege is something that um, people should feel guilty about because I think it's a waste of time and ultimately useless to feel guilty of your privilege. And if you've done something wrong, you better atone to it, but you can't sit and feel guilty. I think that with the privilege that you have to pass that on, to be, you know, uh, a decent member of, of society, and this is what the civic <laughs> duty is supposed to be, you know. So, I think I would just like to add a continuation of what you thought about um, uh, about inequality of the different types of refugees, referring to the class issue. I think Kyra would not let me lie about this. That majority of the efforts that are happening right now and were happening since the beginning of the war in Krakow were, if to say disproportionately, aimed at those lower class refugees. Obviously, no one was giving out free um, uh, mass, uh, free uh, spaces to sleep for people who drove here with family. Um, obviously, that was happening, but this disproportionate, once in quotation marks, disproportionate help to the lower classes of refugees, in a way, allows to level level them up together, I would say, on a larger scale. So it allows to erase certain class differences between them, already giving up the kickstart for those of a lower class to be able to jump forward to the better life that they're searching for. So this is exactly exclusively in my opinion on that. I'm not sure what should I add to this. I can maybe add that we have this experience of working also on the Belarusian border with uh, migrants coming from southwestern Asia. And uh, what I can say is that those people who come here are usually middle class. So they were able to sell their house, sell their stuff, pay like, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars to come and, uh, and to try to reach the uh, European Union. And uh, those who are poor, those who are from the lower class, they stay there and they don't have the capacities, uh, the capacity to, to travel. Uh, within even the cheapest job, which used to be this Belarusian job, was the cheapest job in Europe. 
and it is still it still is. That's why these people are trying to cross it because it's cheaper and much more safer than the Mediterranean, uh, statistically. Um, yeah, and I don't know how to address it. I mean, from my point of view, humanitarian aid shouldn't be like you know. I cannot differentiate if someone comes with Porsche Bentley or he comes somebody from food. I mean, not everyone is either nationality, whatever. My name is Lenita. I represent uh, Villa Vestus. And uh, first of all, I, uh, I wanted to thank you for the discussion. It happened already. It was very interesting to listen to you, and you have such a diverse background. So I started to wonder what would be, I would start from another point. Uh, one of the uh, Georges, we, the Villa Vesus, feel that it was a su successful one, unexpectedly. Was the project titled The Big Job Does Not Need to Bar. It was addressing the youth all around Poland uh, in between 12 and 15 years old, and it was done with an improvisation theater methods. And I wonder, what would be your opinion on the fact that, I mean, it's an over, oversimplification, but still, uh, what we have now in Poland is this totally different attitude towards refugees coming from Ukraine and those refugees coming through the other Russia. This is the question that has been posted already many times by many people. But considering your very diverse background and experience, I would love to listen your opinion on that. What, in your opinion, happened that we were a beautiful, huge golden retrievers to our Ukrainian friends coming over, and we behaved like a Give me an example of a tiny, loudly, scared to death dog towards every other kind of dog. If you may, I would like to start. Um, Polish government, don't kick me out of this country. But I think that, that that's the issue the, the narrative that the government posed about as certain refugees are uh, quote unquote danger to our society and the other type of refugees are our brothers and sisters so um, absolutely racism discrimination but not posed by people rather by the main informational channel from the ruling class let's say um, of this country that superimposed this vision Absolutely personal opinion, please do not pick me up for this argument. I think it's just a good old fashioned white supremacy and, and um, an ethnophobia uh, from, from the Belarusian side. And because there has been many waves of migrations uh, prior to this one. And only now is, is Poland the Golden Retriever. It, I mean, this was even in the first um, reportage of, of, the, of the invasion, where uh, journalists were saying that they feel so heartbroken that the people who are suffering under this invasion are blonde haired and blue eyed people, and that they are you know, relatively civilized people and not like the savage people from Afghanistan. This was said on so many news outlets. So I think that in this, like the, the curtain will fall in. And I think that it's just up to Polish society to, you know, to say with your chest, it's racism. I don't see anything else. Um, there won't take any uh, people from Southwest Asia because they're Muslim. And so I think there was a Polish uh, politician, I don't remember his name, who was talking about how 
I probably would allow for um, Ukrainian, white Ukrainians to come into the country and they will be welcomed and, and treated really well. But um, on the Belarusian side, he referred to the people there as illegals and specifically to the Middle Eastern people on that side of the border, mm -hmm. that they were illegal and that they wanted to come to Europe to spread jihad. Um, so they would not be let in, and if they were let in, there would be serious consequences for them. And then in this um, news snippet, they showed who the said jihadists were, and it was people with children on their backs, with not enough clothing, in minus nine degrees. So this, this um, I don't know, white supremacy really gives people a lot of strength, because for you to be able to switch off your humanity in that way is really outstanding. Um, and I don't, I don't see it changing anytime soon, to be honest, because everybody was um, throwing their hands up when the United, um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, but the United States has now reinvaded Somalia, and nothing is being spoken about this, because again, it feeds into that trope of, you know, savage lands deserve this, you know, and there, there shouldn't be any kind of, um, you know, retribution. There shouldn't be any any sort of uh, plea to stop this because it's just how the wheel runs. Um, but I think that there was a little bit of a spanner in the wheel when it came to Ukraine. Thank you for saying that. I can just add that it's a, yeah, it's a more old European racism. It's not only more old European Union that treats the same refugees and immigrants coming through all the ways to European Union. And it's like old stuff where uh, it never changed. And I think it's like if your question should be the question of what's the roots of, of European racism, right? Why we still believe that brown and black people are worse than white or Europeans are better than others and uh, create this uh, vision of European Union as being like the paradise on earth because this is why people try to come here and then they are like you know frustrated because it's not it's not that, that nice. It's like the same when Polish people were going to UK in 2004, 2005 they said yeah UK is super cool while they were actually you know really suffering in London and other cities Okay. And then it turned out it's not that far away, but they had to show up behind these people out there or, or friends in Poland. Um, so there are a lot of mechanisms, and I can recommend books for those who are interested. Uh, concerning Islamophobia, I believe the best is Monika Bobako, Islamophobia, Technologia Gaza, and so on, which is only in Polish, but it's one of the best academic books, even in Polish, I would say. And we are lucky to have it. Uh, then I would recommend Akila and the book uh, Politics of Enmity. And he really uh, goes deep into the politics of um, uh, creating refugee camps. Why do we need to other the others? Actually, there are certain politicians in Poland who are um, creating fear against Ukrainian refugees because Ukraine has. Uh, uh, certain but a quite uh, big minority of uh, Jewish and Muslims referring to the West Yeah, I'm afraid it won't be just one political party very soon. Um, and the third book is, of course, actually, I think I can read any book of Franz Fanon. I think it goes very deep into why. Why uh, we have racism uh, within the European culture. It's not only in Poland. And I, I, I believe, you know, I always admired Ukrainian openness somehow, especially in cities like Kiev or Odessa. Uh, but uh, I know I'm afraid that this situation will also affect the white Ukrainians and will uh, somehow uh, create uh, this sense of being better than the others. And I really compassion.
I also just wanted to add to the list because you mentioned Yashu Mbembe. Um, his book um, or his essay titled Never Politics was also really, really good. Um, and it basically talks about migration and the creation of deaf worlds um, and the um, kind of symbiotic relationship that the EU and the US have to destabilize regions that they're often involved in. And I think it's, it's just they said just everything, so it's you know, it's the same that it's like you know, it's of course Poland is many people there, and I will do a few times that they openly, and I think that it's something we would be ashamed of, and I believe we will, uh, and it won't be forgotten. Um, but for example, in my activism, I'm trying. Um, to look for like a positive thing sometimes. So uh, what I saw here, for example, uh, that like a lot of beautiful people were were trying to do as much as they could uh, to support, uh, and also like everything that was happening uh, in the region was amazing when it comes to the local people. Uh, and uh, and I now I'm thinking also that uh, like in the last three four years like. Polish state all the time is like doing like a test on us as a society to being more organized uh, to know to like, like that's why I think that in the last two months we were able to be like to do some so many things like in a small and like short term of time because because we already did it in, during the fall we already like organized ourselves in 2019 and 20 uh, so we already had the tools for it. Uh, but we just are more and more tired, and I think it's also like a strategy of politicians to to just you know to like suck the powers from us. And I will just add, sorry for that. I'm sorry, I'm trying to do too much, but uh, it answers these questions about education as well and about the class. Like I feel that we have this crisis of responsibility in uh, our political class, and I don't. And I feel that local government is also not responsible for what's happening in terms of like I and I really hope it's not like the, like we will not wait that long for a change. I mean that I really hope that we are in times of something. Uh, maybe it's not a revolution, but if there is a big change coming because everything must change in time in terms of. Uh, climate catastrophe, in terms of this migration crisis, in terms of, uh, yeah, next year we'll have hunger, hunger everywhere because of the situation, and uh, the, the migration will move more and more every year. European societies will not feel that welfare which they felt for decades right now, and it will bring change. And uh, it, it, it lies on us and it lies on this responsibility. Uh, if we we'll really create the change and think of us and think critically of us and think what we can do really, or we will just stay on the side of showing up and talking to what we do and not, and not actually doing it, which is done actually by our politicians. But yeah, I'm a bit frustrated with, with our politicians. Okay, last question. Uh, I have a small question. Uh, if I understand uh, correctly, what you said at one point of the conversation said that uh, three years ago something happened uh, uh, to which uh, LGBT organizations had to uh, with networks uh, behind uh, all this. And I would uh, ask you to explain for me at the end uh, okay. what, uh, what was that great disaster. <laughs> I was trying like, to keep myself to not speak too much about the situation of LGBT community, so I'm going to keep it in the space. But uh, at the beginning of 2019, uh, Polish government started like a LGBT election in Poland. Uh, it was like the beginning of three elections in, because we had like the European Parliament elections. Uh, uh, at the end of the year, we had general elections in Poland, and in 2020, we had presidential elections. 
So uh, in 2015, um, during also like the refugee uh, the refugee uh, thing in, in Europe, uh, Law and Justice Party, who uh, won elections, uh, started to build their politics on fear against the refugees. And in 2019, they built their campaigns on the fear uh, against the LGBTQI community. Uh, so there was like a lot of words about us being like a threat to the nation, uh, about you know like teaching kids of masturbation, uh, and it was more and more hate speech, uh, which started also like you know the rules of violence, um, the rules of like verbal uh, violence, or, of course physical violence. Um, and also what started to happen that uh, like the right-wing organizations uh, started to promote like ideas of like symbolic declarations of regions um, declared themselves like LGBT free zones and the lesson Poland, which in Krakow is based, was one of those for two years uh, for the like the middle of September 2021, I think, when it was but it was uh, uh, overrun because the uh, European Commission, after two years of advertising and, uh, and speaking, that it can't happen, like things like this can't happen just in the European Union. Um, like a set of threat to the, to the local locals, governments, for example, that they won't get more uh, European money if they will be like, you know, LGBT free zones. So, and like, I think that. Also, what was important happened in 2020 during the presidential campaign. Our president Duda said to one of the rallies that uh, LGBT people are not uh, humans, they are ideology. So, like, it was 2019 was like the beginning of the long marathon of campaigns, uh, and uh, which were just about like that we are not like a like about exclude. exclude Trying to exclude us from the from the society, but also from the local community when it comes to those uh, declarations or deals about uh, LGBT free, free zones, free from LG, LGBT ideology. Okay. I hope that it it will be like it was very short. <laughs> okay, so we are um, almost running out of time, and I uh, will. Close our discussion by reading from my book. So none of the poems have titles. So. God gave man the word, and in the word was his name. Man took the word and interpreted it in his likeness, the likeness only of the man. The world, the word condemned the woman, and the sore where the body of the murdered lesbian lay soaked with blood, absolved her for justice she could not receive. In the name of God was she killed. And in the name of God will her murderer be forgiven, in the land of the free, where we are equals before the law. Yet it is more righteous to kill the innocent, to blame the victim and forgive the rapist, in the name of God. Laws are made to justify the killing of entire races of people, and in the name of God, European government will absolve to carry an action when the dead bodies wash up on the shores of this continent. There is no limit to the condemnation of this world and the loathing that seeps into the core of those subjugated by it. The word of God taught women to hate themselves and seek supremacy in the oppression of others, to look for redemption in violence, condone violence committed unto other women in the name of God. They threw acid on the brown face of a man suspected of being gay and strangled a trans woman in the passenger seat of an old car. Always in the name, and the enlightenment that justifies the violence. Eternal damnation awaits the woman, the Negro, the homo, with no place to stand in the land of the free. 
Lord, it's more righteous to kill the innocent, to blame the victim and forgive the rapist. In the name of God, pray for us now and be off our death. Pray for us now and be off our death. Pray for us now and be off our death. Pray for us. So that is it for tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank mm-hmm. you.